Yeah, I think the main takeaway for me over the last six months has been that like this uh, trading engine now competes with centralized exchanges. It has the ability to compete on an open interest basis. It has the ability to compete on funding rates, um, on execution prices, fills, you know, uh, just overall efficiency. It's there. Uh, and so, you know, for me, watching over the last year as uh, this has kind of played out, I've been like, OK, you know, we're there. We finally built the thing five years later that, that you know, we set out to build. Um, it can compete with centralized exchanges. How do we now scale it up? What's what's the next uh, kind of level to take it to? Welcome to the Edge Podcast. I'm DeFi Dad here with Nomadic from 4RC. Today's show covers the recent release of Synthetix V3 on the Ethereum L2 base. Having powered over 43 billion in trade volume, Synthetix provides liquidity for permissionless derivatives such as perpetual futures and options across EVM chains such as Ethereum Mainnet and Optimism. In this episode, we'll talk with Synthetix founder Kane Warwick and core contributor Noah Litvin about what makes Synthetix Perps V3 different, as well as their integration with the newly launched centralized exchange Infinex, and why Kane is still more bullish than ever on the future of DeFi built on Ethereum. But before we do, just a quick word from our sponsors who make the Edge podcast possible. Introducing the Mantle Liquid Staking Protocol, Mantle LSP, a permissionless, non-custodial ETH liquid staking protocol deployed on Ethereum L1 and governed by Mantle. With Mantle LSP, users can stake ETH to instantly receive ME, earn yield and accumulate rewards the longer you stake. METH is the value accumulating receipt token that will give you access to expanded yield opportunities. Stake and watch your yield grow with Mantle LSP. For most of us, our crypto journey started with MetaMask. And now with MetaMask Portfolio, we can do so much more. MetaMask Portfolio puts you in control. Use the dashboard to see all your assets and balances across your wallets in one place. The buy feature allows us to buy crypto assets effortlessly with fiat options such as PayPal or credit card. The swap feature allows us to swap any tokens anytime by finding a selection of available rates. The bridge feature allows us to bridge between networks including Ethereum, L1s, and L2s based on the best price and fastest delivery time. And with the stake feature, anyone in a few clicks can stake ETH and earn rewards. Do more in Web3 your way with a safe, simple, and convenient tool that's all in one place. Track and manage your Web3 everything at metamask.io slash portfolio. Mike, before we get back to the show, can you explain what is liquid restaking? Everybody at this point is familiar with the liquid staking. It lets you take your stake ETH, mint a liquid staking token, and then use that token in DeFi. Well, the hottest thing in staking right now is restaking. It's the ability to reuse your stake ETH to provide Ethereum's trust layer to other services that want to benefit from it. Services like data availability layers, Oracle networks, other blockchains, and beyond. The benefit of restaking is that you get to earn additional staking rewards on top of your normal staking rewards. Well, uh, currently, if you want to restake your ETH, uh, your only option is to lock up uh, your ETH. The reason that's a problem is because you can't use your restaked ETH in DeFi. We are launching ETH, uh, the EtherFi liquid restaking token, because with liquid uh, restaking, users get the benefit of staking rewards, restaking rewards, and they get to collect loyalty points for EtherFi and Eigenlayer through this token. So it's the easiest way to get exposure to two up and coming uh, early uh, protocols. And on top of that, get all the benefits of staking and restaking. To learn more about ETH liquid staking and liquid restaking, go to ether.fi. It all started so simply with CryptoKitties and Maker on Ethereum, but quickly became complex with more applications and many chains. Today, everyone agrees, UX issues are the biggest blocker standing in the way of crypto adoption. Introducing Avocado. Multi-chain UX redesigned from the ground up. The first wallet to abstract networks, accounts and gas. One gas tank to pay transaction fees on all chains in USDC. And native access to Instadap's powerful, custom DeFi strategies. Avocado, one wallet to rule all chains.
All right, let's introduce the founder of Synthetics, Kane Warwick, as well as a core contributor at Synthetics, Noah Litvin. Kane and Noah, welcome to the Edge Podcast. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for joining us, guys. So we want to dumb down, you know, these two major releases. Uh, Synthetics, the the liquidity platform that is V3 that's coming, and then the Perps platform, which uh, many of us, uh, I mean, we at 4RC actually use Perps V Perps V2 through Quenta. Um, it's a very popular DeFi uh, Perps trading platform. You know, I want to call out the fact that I thought V2 came out like end of 2022, December 2022, something like that. And then we saw this this optimism trading incentives program go live. And this occupied a lot of our attention, like living through this past bear market. I mean, it was one of the, the few bright spots. We were able to start to trade on optimism um, and, you know, really relish the benefits of being 100% in control of our assets while trading on uh, synthetics uh, perps V2. So... That said, uh, there's this major release called Andromeda, which encompasses Synthetics V3 and their Perps V3. And, and so we're going to talk all about that today. King, do you want to just kick us off with maybe some of the takeaways from V2? Correct me if, if these numbers are, aren't accurate, but I, I thought I read that you did $40 billion in total trade volume, uh, which is remarkable. And it was something like $28 million in trading fees for uh, SNX stakers. So let's call that a success with V2. I'm curious, like, what were some of the takeaways from that um, that will lead us into V3? Yeah, I think the main takeaway for me over the last six months has been that, like, this uh, trading engine now competes with centralized exchanges. It has the ability to compete on an open interest basis. It has the ability to compete on funding rates, um, on execution prices, fills, you know, uh, just overall efficiency. It's there. Uh, And so... You know, for me, watching over the last year as uh, this has kind of played out, I've been like, okay, you know, we're there. We finally built the thing five years later that, that you know, we set out to build. Um, it can compete with centralized exchanges. How do we now scale it up? What's what's the next uh, kind of level to take it to? Um, and I think that a bunch of things that, you know, all of that success is built on a very rickety old platform, right? It's been around since you know, 2018, 2019, some of those contracts, right? And so V3 was like a complete reimagining of the entire like liquidity layer. And then Perps V3 is maybe a bit more of an incremental improvement on on Perps V2. And so the idea was roll all of that up into something that's kind of, you know, comprehensible for people, call it Andromeda. Um, you know, you know if you're trading on Andromeda versus the legacy system, it's going to be deployed to base first. Um, you know, you can use USDC. Uh, et cetera. So um, that's that's kind of been the the takeaway for me is that you know this next thing that's coming out is a complete redesign of the system, so it's much more efficient. Um, and then from a product perspective, uh, you know there's some cool new functionality, but it's basically the same uh, system that people have been using and loving for the last year. I want to point out that with V2, I think what caught me by surprise is you know at some point in 2023 because i was participating in this op rewards program and using quenta and and other front ends like polynomial and it just like struck me that when we were using synthetics v1 everything was there on the synthetics app you know the idea was that eventually synthetics would power other front ends and and like i think truthfully I, i did not believe that would happen back then i just it felt like it was so far into the future and then here we are in 2023, like four years after DeFi summer. And I'm like, holy cow, like there is an ecosystem now of, of you know, synthetics apps. Um, do you want to just give a quick sort of highlights reel of the synthetics ecosystem today? Like some of the apps that that are there and, and some of the things you can do uh, with synthetics liquidity powering it. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the trading front ends are, I, I think like the generate the most, um, traffic and, um, sort of volume and attention from end users like Quenta, um, um, the polynomial you mentioned, Infinex, uh, D hedge is working on different, um, they, they've evolved for a uh, V2 and they're working on a vault for V3 on the, um, to sort of streamline the, uh, liquidity provisioning. 
um, aspect of it. Um, the V2 system uh, issues a, a decentralized stablecoin, and then so a lot of the um, ecosystem around V2 relies on that stablecoin um, to settle trades or um, just sort of builds additional DeFi products on top of. Um, so yeah, I guess the way that I think about it is you have sort of the liquidity provisioning side and you have the trading side, um, and then there's a variety of apps and um, integrations that can be built on both ends. And that exists for V2, and they're already cropping up quickly for V3. Guys, something Kane mentioned there was just, you know, this idea of getting to centralized exchange parity. That's kind of always been a bit of a dream uh, for, for DeFi. I want to come back to that and talk to that more later. But I think a good way to kind of talk about these new releases is through the lens of Andromeda. So we were talking before the pod a bit, and unbeknownst to me, Andromeda's live right now to some degree. Maybe one of you can kind of explain why I'm saying it like that. But also um, in, in a recent blog, I, I, I read through a bunch of SIPs that make up Andromeda. It'd be cool if we could hit on some of those more prominent ones. Um, so whoever kind of best to speak to that, like let's, let's go through the Andromeda release kind of at like a high level uh, for starters. And then we can maybe dive into each of those a bit further. Yeah, I think I think Noah could probably handle the sips, but in terms of uh, why, you know, Andromeda is live, right, um, in scare quotes, uh, it's a gentleman by the name of um, uh, Caleb, uh, who is the new benevolent dictator of, uh, risk dictator of synthetics, you might say, um, who takes a very uh, strong view in terms of like how to scale out a system like this. Um, you know, obviously there's other people involved in, in working through that, but the idea is we have a legacy system and this is one of the benefits of deploying uh, Andromeda base, right? We have a legacy system, it's working, you can still trade on it. The I would say the main reason why people are not necessarily hugely aware of your ability to trade um, on Andromeda on base right now is that Synthetics has deployed it, but the front ends who go and build the ability to actually execute trades are not quite there yet. Um, you know, there's, there's, you know, I guess, an ongoing integration that's happening um, across the ecosystem. Uh, but also just the majority of traders are still trading on the legacy system on, on Optimism. Um, so that's that's kind of uh, the, the situation, I guess. Uh, but then, you know, probably over the next month, um, open interest caps and, uh, and markets will be scaled out. Uh, so by the time we get to, you know, maybe January, early Feb, uh, Hopefully, Andromeda will be in a position to compete, uh, at least with some of the markets, um, with the legacy system. So, some of these like SIPs, I think, kind of tell a, a pretty cool story. Like, like one, I for sure like. I know listeners are going to want to hear about the buyback and burn. Of course, like that is directly related to token go up. That might be the least important thing that you guys want to talk about. But uh, yeah, so I guess just like so in this blog that I was kind of referencing, some of them that stood out like. Okay, d- deploy to deploy V3 core on base, uh, deploy SNX token via base bridge. I feel like these kind of tell the story of like laying out some of the things that have happened. And then like just getting into even more like what is Perps v- V3 enabling USDC for Andromeda on base, what that means to the ecosystem um, as a whole kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the SIPs are the roadmap, right? I think Noah can speak to that from a technical perspective if, you know, you want me to speak to the ponzinomics side of things i'm happy to do that in terms of buybacks and burns and all kinds of fun narrative things switching off inflation etc what one one way to go into it is like um w- w- what's exciting about v3 to me is like that we we really try hard to get the abstractions right so the code base that we have right now can be stood up and it is on uh main net and optimism for v3 uh, just without perps right now but otherwise it's configured to match v2 where it takes SNX's collateral into one pool, it issues a stable coin, and it can back markets. Um, but what's super cool is that, you know, I mean, the game is changing in crypto week to week. Um, base is live, uh, sentiment around different stable coins changes. Like, you know, it's it's a new game all the time, right? So we're able to take all of this code, um, you know, that we spend quite a bit of time on and, uh, you know, got audited. <laughs> um, and then we can sort of spin the knobs and turn it into this different configuration, put it on base, have it accept USDC, um, put the new perps markets on it, um, you know, with like BTC ETH with these caps. And then um, just, you know, ba- based on 
effectively governance's risk appetite, uh, we can start spinning the knobs and, and sort of take a deployment in, in whatever direction we want. Um, so just, this is to say from a technical standpoint, like th there's something very cool about, um, like the, the code and the abstractions that we have all of these knobs to turn, to, to turn it into whatever we want. And then, um, and then we have the Andromeda release, which is one particular configuration that we think is going to be exciting for people to use, um, as we have all of this code sort of, uh, you know, rubber meets the road all with, with, with the new, um, perks markets and everything. I I'd love to just talk a little bit about the choice to move to base. Uh, I am not the most informed at the technical level to, you know, tell someone how centralized or decentralized base is as an L2. I know that most of the L2s, like they're in a very nascent stage of their development still. And like the long-term vision of how decentralized they would be, like it's still a bit off. That said, I guess like, how do you explain where base is today? The fact that synthetics is moving to it, for me, it's, it's, it's quite a bit of signal. Like I, I still think of synthetics as always like one of the most like decentralized progressive types of protocols out there adopting like whatever we have to, to, to like build the true DeFi dream. So anyways, um, what, what went into that decision as a community to, to move over to base? I think the, the primary thing that shifted is this idea of a, um, siloed deployment versus a uh, monolithic cross-chain deployment. You know, the vision has always been for a long time, right? Even when this vision was nonsensical, like there was just no practical, technical way to to get there. And we're closer today, but we're still not quite there. Um, but, you know, there was this vision in like, even back in 2018 of having uh, multiple networks with, uh, you know, this, this liquidity layer that's spread across and having fungible assets, right? So, SUSD on one network is fungible, you know, across all of these different networks and being able to stake on different networks, et cetera. That was the grand vision for a long time. And I think where things have shifted is the idea of a V3 enabling uh, more fragmented deployments. It was very hard in the legacy system to do separate deployments. Deployments were a really challenging thing and to manage that would have been uh, very hard. So our, um, our old CTO uh, kind of stop that from ever happening um historically uh because the overhead was you know we couldn't do a uniswap style or ave style just deploy on every chain and see how it goes but with v3 we can and so there was this opportunity to sort of reflect i guess on everything we've learned over the last like four or five years and sort of say does this actually make sense given that we can't yet even achieve it how much effort would it take for us to attempt to achieve that across even two networks right what would that look like um and does it not make sense for us to silo the risk, silo the execution uh, of you know some of these deployments, and give ourselves the ability to do something like USDC on base? Because you ha if you have a monolithic deployment, then you have this uh, you know contagion effect, right? If you do USDC on one network, it's basically USDC on every network. Um, and th this is, I think, the the thing that has kind of shifted right in the community. This idea of Let's go and do these small experiments. Synthetics has always been like an iterative experiment, right? But it's been an iterative experiment in this monolithic cross-chain environment. And now it's like, let's actually try Andromeda on base and see how that goes. And as Noel says, having done that, let's do the experiment. Let's see what the results are. And then let's figure out what we do on Optimism, right? And, you know, maybe what we do on our own synthetics app chain for example, or maybe on Polygon or Starkware or, you know, any num or Solana or any number of networks, right? Probably not Solana. Another reason why uh, I think base is a natural sort of next step for synthetics is that it's built on the OP stack. So it's basically running all the same software that Optimism is running on. Um, and so like one example is we did a, a sort of a dry run, like a, a test deployment onto uh, an Arbitrum test net to see what would happen and there was like sort of a strange error but then we ran it for real and it worked fine and like that's a little alarming like it's i'm sure it's fine we can figure it out but like stuff like that doesn't happen with base it's like we know that um everything that we've been doing on on optimism like at that layer of the of the tech stack is is the same code um so also just from an like an iterative sort of risk management standpoint um base is a is a natural next step uh, King, you had just made mention of Solana and 
like a year ago, I would have kind of nodded my head and said, yeah, of course. Like why, why would anyone consider Solana? Like, yeah, what, look what happened with FTX and all of this, you know, they, they've had like a, a real turnaround, a real like run up in terms of activity and interest. Um, any thoughts or on, on Solana in terms of like, there's a battle I think still between EVM and non EVM, uh, You've been in the space building, you know, as long as anybody. A- any thoughts on on this uh, as it relates to synthetics and Solana? Yeah, you know, I remember uh, SBF and I had a debate years ago, like maybe going back to like 2019 or something like that, or around Solana. And my view, I guess, was that the and, and you know, I, I still think this is somewhat right that the trade offs that Solana was making. Um, you know, and and the design uh, sort of uh, configuration that they had chosen um, was not the optimal one, right? It was optimizing for some things. Um, and I think that, you know, my view was and kind of remains that the pendulum sort of on Solana swung too far in one direction, right? Towards, um, you know, fewer nodes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that said, if you look at the landscape now and you look at, how many of the alt ones are pivoting towards, you know, layer twos or something like that. There's not that many unique configurations of blockchains, really, right? Like we've sort of seen things falling into a couple of different categories and differentiating yourself in the EVM compatible sort of, you know, slight tweak to the EVM, you know, whatever, uh, you know, zone has, has become harder and harder. And so we've seen some of those, uh, like Celo, you know, for example, pivot towards being an L2. And I think that that's a much more viable thing to kind of come back to the mothership, which is something actually that I did predict in that, um, in that, uh, not that they would become L2s, but that like people would kind of come back to the Ethereum, uh, you know, uh, mothership at some point. And I think that's happening in a way that I didn't expect, but it's, it's definitely there, right? Um, so, that's interesting because what that does is actually clear space for a Solana or Solana-like network that has made very different design choices, right? That has a different approach that's not EBM compatible to become a credible threat to Ethereum, right? And the more the EBM compatible chains get you know, reabsorbed, the more it becomes, well, the, actually you have Bitcoin that does nothing, cool. And then you have Ethereum that does a whole bunch of things, right? And then you have this other thing called Solana that does a whole bunch of other things, but in a different way. And that is something that I think the average person can grok, right? Like it's not that, you know, it's not like, well, let me explain to you the difference between Near and Celo and, you know, Avalanche and, you know, different consensus mechanisms, whatever. It's like, oh, no, 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 okay. Like this is the more decentralized, slower version, right? That now is moving towards a different architecture of data, et cetera. And this is just the fast one, right? This is the one that that you know, optimizes for speed, and that I, I think could be an interesting thing that sort of plays out. And you might find that we get to the end of this cycle, and it really is the top three of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, and the rest are are kind of washed out in in the noise. Um, so in that respect, I think Solana is in a very good place. It, it has the most differentiated narrative, if you will, of all of the Altel ones now, um, and. You know, I think even Vitalik said this, right? Like, you know, it appears that there is a nascent and growing Solana community and, and being forced to do things non-EVM and, and kind of learn your own things does actually kind of keep people in that ecosystem. I think there's a little bit of ecosystem lock-in that may be different to uh, if you just, you know, deploy something on an Ethereum L2, you can kind of jump around wherever you want. We've even kind of noticed with the, the limited applications that are live there. Like I'm speaking strictly to DeFi. There's a lot of other applications with different use cases there. It, it felt like uh, there's less of a need to divert your attention to too many different applications. And it kind of reminded me of like early days of synthetics where it's like, there's a user base. We're all excited to be in DeFi. It's this new thing. And we only have to split our attention across so many things. And that it, it creates a lot of, uh, it just creates a really strong sense of community that's very vocal and evangelizes what you're what you're using. And in a way, I feel like they're sort of benefiting from it. But I mean, yeah, like blockchains are, are a combination of like religion and finance, right? 
Um, and so, you know, Solana is like the, this upstart religion, right. With like a whole bunch of weird dogma that like the Ethereum people are like, wait, what? Like, that's strange, right? We don't necessarily, I feel like they're the church with the live band and the guys like on the hundred uh, percent swinging yeah, from the rafters and Ethereum. Exactly. I'm, I'm like going yeah. to mass and I'm, 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 you know, doing all it's the things I'm for, supposed to as yeah, a Catholic. Much and, more stayed. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. I agree with that. It is a funny thing about. Yeah, the, the way the communities have progressed where like Ethereum has smaller blocks, so the scaling solution is having more blockchains, but then it's like, we can't all just go to the same layer too, because then you'll just get congestion there. So everyone sort of has factions of like, I'm an Arbitrum guy, I'm an Optimism guy. And then like long term, we'll get better cross-chain abstractions and you're just interacting with synthetics that's using Ethereum and all of that. But like, while we're in this sort of scaling, like awkward adolescent phase, there's like, yeah, sort of weird factionalism and things breaking out. But yeah, with Solana, you can just keep submitting to their big blocks and not pay much fees. And yeah, you know, I get it. To extend the analogy there as well, like Bitcoin's like, you know, sun worship or something, right? Like these guys that are just like standing out on a beach somewhere, just like staring up at the sun, being blinded or something. And they're like, just like who can stare at the sun the longest or something. I love it. Um, okay. Getting back to Andromeda, we could probably go down this rabbit hole all day. Um, so something else that stood out to me was some, I guess, NGU tech that you're applying to the SNX token. There's going to be a buyback and burn as part of this base launch, I believe. Um, and then I don't know if that's kind of like wrapped into the the broader uh, bits I've been seeing about SNX not being inflationary anymore. Maybe one of you can speak to both those parts or if those are kind of one and the same. Yeah, I think this is this is an interesting thing, right? Um, as we get closer to contemplating SNX not being the primary collateral or not being a collateral, right? And obviously, we want to do the experiment, right? If we do it on base and we find that no one wants to collateralize the network with the USDC, whatever reason, right? And that really it was just the kind of captured users of SNX that were collateralizing the system and willing to take the risk. Uh, now, in the old days, right? It was very risky to stake. I'm sure there's uh, people amongst us who have, um, you know, some battle scars, right, from staking SNX and and you know debt inflation uh, back in 2019. You know when peak pumped and we were mega long teeth and yeah, everyone got wrecked pretty hard and then flipped short and you know it was it was not a great experience, right, staking SNX for a long time. Obviously, you had the SNX price appreciation because you're denominating SNX, so that helped to offset the pain. In fact. I think most of us probably did well, but, you know, a lot of gains that you would have had from just holding a token were given up, right? But you couldn't just hold the token because it was hyperinflationary. So if you just held it, you'd get inflated out, right? And so you had this very powerful system that was kind of forcing you, if you wanted to be in the system, you had to be all in, right? There was no alternative. You couldn't be a passive holder. I mean, you could be a passive holder, but there were very few, of them, right? Um, and you even would have done okay starting at the beginning of 2019, being a passive holder, you would have just done, you know, 4x worse than an active holder, let's say, something like that, right? Um, and so we had this system where it was hyperinflationary, you had to stake if you wanted to keep pace with the rest of the network, right? Um, and passive holders were really punished. And we needed that because we needed people to stake to collateralize the network, right? Now we have this opportunity to test out, do people want to stake USDC? in a network that is not as high risk, right? Because the primary product is delta neutral and you can kind of stake and it doesn't really move. Of course, you're you're the lender of last resort or you're like the last, um, you know, uh, person out, right? If you're staking um, and if there is, uh, you know, a huge skew or a loss or whatever, you're absolutely absorbing that. Loss. So it's not like it's riskless, but it's far less risky than it used to be staking. And, and people may just not be interested in that. My suspicion is they will, but you know, if they're not, that's going to be a very interesting data point for us to then take to optimism to figure out what we do with Andromeda on optimism or, you know, with uh, whatever the next version is, right? Um, you know, that, that we deploy there with whatever parameters we deploy. Um, and so as we get close to at least contemplating no SNX collateral, right, we need to start thinking about what does that mean? Well, it means that if it's if it's not as critical to collateralize the network with SNX, we can actually now accommodate passive people. We don't need to take them out the back and shoot them, right? Like, you know, it was a very harsh regime that we were operating for a long time, right? If you didn't 
if you didn't stake your SNX, we just wanted you out, right? Like we had no interest in, in you participating. And so, okay, cool. Um, you can stake and you can, you know, uh, earn fees from uh, Andromeda on base, right? You being a USDC holder. And half of those fees go to SNX holders. But then the question was, okay, if the fees go to SNX holders in the same way that they do now on uh, on Optimism, um, then is that the optimal method for distributing the rewards, right? Because we're not now punishing people. There's no inflation. Inflation has been turned off. So you can hold SNX and you're not going to be inflated out, right? So your percentage of the network won't be diluted. So that's cool. But if you get no reward from even holding SNX, then there's plenty of other projects out there that arguably you could say are going to be a better hold, right? You'd be better participating in some other network that has a better system for rewarding holders, right? Um, now, if you believe that this network is going to take off and there's going to be 20 different deployments and it's going to have you know tens of billions of volume, then of course, right? Like it makes sense to hold the token because that's you know the the thing that represents ownership, of it, right? But it's not getting uh, any of the fees from it. There's no there's no kind of fee, and so then it was like, okay, well, why don't we take this opportunity? on base to actually experiment with two things simultaneously, which is not great because you have confounding variables, but they're somewhat independent, right? And one of the independent things was, okay, are people willing to stake a non-SNX collateral in synthetics in a delta neutral system? And then the second thing is, do people like the idea of passively holding SNX if there is this buyback and burn mechanism as a way of distributing the revenue from base versus the legacy system where you have to stake in order to get the benefit because it's basically your debt is being paid back. And so these are two different kinds of systems and we can run them simultaneously and sort of see how many people are shifting from one to the other. How big is one relative to the other? How interesting are these incentives? It's a very powerful thing to be able to test all of these different structures. And you know, my view is that buybacks and burns are not an efficient way of doing things, right? In the sense of um, if you want to optimize for a behavior, um, there's a lot of leakage of value, but if you don't, if you no longer need to optimize for that behavior, which we may no longer need to, then it's actually a very good mimetic, you know, uh, aligned narrative to test out, and and it may work quite well. And if base is doing really well, and if it's doing as well as the legacy system now, as an SNX staker, you get all of the fee burn plus you get this buyback and burn. So hopefully you get this double sided effect, right? Um, which should, you know, encourage people to both stake and hold. But again, the the goal of all of this was to no longer have this incredibly punitive system of like you stake SNX or you're dead. So today, if you're staking SNX, you're, you're uh, getting uh, fees, but you're also getting this uh, inflationary reward that is SNX. But when this new system well, today, goes that's gone. That's gone. Oh, that's right. That's gone. Inflation's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Okay, so now, so now as an SNX staker, we're living off of just uh, the the trading fees, kind of growing up, and as the system has matured. Um, but uh, the the clever choice here, then, I guess, is uh, if I decide I, I want to stay on optimism, that I don't want to participate in uh, this V three just yet on base. I still should be benefiting as that system accrues more more fees this through this buyback and burn like as an SNX holder. It, that's that's the way we're sort of bridging the gap here. The fact that we've got a deployment on one L two, we've got other folks that are only on let's say Ethereum mainnet, other folks who are only on on Optimism. Um, it, yeah, it, it feels it feels like like a, a really valid experiment, and and I'm I'm really interested to see what. What sort of results you'll you'll see from this? And I, if you think about it on a numbers basis, right? You know, I think it's something on the order of about a million dollars in fees is generated in the legacy system on Optimism a week. Um, so you know, that would be depending on on the price. You know, a few hundred thousand SNX a week, right? Um, you know, it's not we're not talking like single digit percentage points here, right? But if base starts doing very well, it is the the new system, right? Hope and it is you know, more open to a lot of different traders because of this USDC component. If it starts doing really well and it's doing, you know, two million, three million, five million dollars fees or ten million dollars worth of fees a week, now all of a sudden you actually are talking about a meaningful uh buyback and burn. 
and and you know it's a meaningful percentage of the supply that's being burnt on a monthly basis. So there is a lot of upside opportunity at base if this base deployment works. I might have read this in the Perps V3 blog post, or it could have been the Andromeda uh, post. Yeah, are we expecting that Perps V3 or Synthetics V3 will that also go live uh, eventually on Ethereum uh, mainnet? I thought I was reading that like you're trying to cater, like Synthetics is trying to cater to some traders who prefer to be on mainnet. It kind of like I, I almost thought I misread it because so many of us clearly have been pushing for for L2. But it, it, can you talk at all about like the um, the decision there to to continue to support mainnet. Yeah, maybe Noah can speak to this because there's some technical constraints around why that was not possible. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, technically, we could we could put this same perps implementation on the uh, attach it to the L1 mainnet deployment. But I think what you're probably referring to is um, that there's some of the core contributors have been working on um, a special perps implementation uh, for L1 that's really just designed to generate a wrapped basis trade. Um, so you could uh, margin a 1x short ETH position with an equivalent amount of like wrapped stake ETH. Um, and the idea is that's like a decentralized uh, delta neutral asset that then a, um, a stable coin could be issued against. And so, um, and, and that could live on L L1. Um, and it's not about creating, it, it's more of like this sort of experiment to try to um, support an ultra scalable decentralized stable coin that's super reliable. Um, whereas like the, the perps implementation on Andromeda and elsewhere is more about, um, creating a user experience. It's more competitive with a, with a centralized exchange, uh, is more feature rich. Um, and, um, yeah, so there, there, are uh, sort of two flavors of, uh, um, perps implementations. Um, that said, like, yeah, we, we could, we couldn't deploy Perps V3 as it's built on L1, but like, a, as it's been designed, we, w we wouldn't anticipate uh, uh, too much usage just due to gas fees, basically. Noah, that implementation that you just walked through on ETH mainnet, it, it sounds like a bit similar to another project that we had on the pod recently, Athena. Um, is that in any part, uh, kind of due to supporting uh, like their their new product that they're launching, or is this is this like totally separate? Because I know I, I can't remember which blog, but I, I was reading some sort of partnership that Athena has formed with Synthetics. But maybe one of you can kind of speak to that because I think both DeFi Dad and I think Athena could be pretty huge, and it's great to see that they've kind of decided to align and support, or you know, synergistically uh, with 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 both you and uh, with them. Yeah, so I, I know uh, the the team behind Athena pretty well. Um, it's interesting because uh, I obviously read um, Arthur Hayes' blog posts, and, and you know that was kind of where that came from, right? That idea, um, I guess, of uh, this you know Dalton. Obviously, you know, being a he's up there staring at the sun, poor Arthur, um, as well as Coin Maxis, right? Um, uh, that's not fair. He's he's deep into other degenerate areas of the space as well, but he's still you know he's still a BTC maxi at heart. And so he had this idea of like let's do it using Bitcoin, right? And it's like, well, you understand that uh, we can't do decentralized Bitcoin perps, right? That are actually you know uh, margined with actual Bitcoin, um, which uh, I think you know my immediate response when I read that article is like, this is such a stretch to not just accept that it should be ETH. Like it's so obvious, like. If you like, if you're writing that article and you're like, it has to be Bitcoin, like there's no way it can be ETH. Like it's just an obvious thing, right? Um, and so I think some of the people from Athena read that as well, and they were like, hey, this is we should totally do this, but just do it in a sense. Um, what's interesting about Athena is it has a similar approach to some of the challenges in the market right now as Infidex does, right? Like this idea of you know, let's build something that is incredibly usable as opposed to like, you know, purely decentralized, right? Um, let's actually optimize for something that is accessible to people and, and you know, can be, uh, can be scaled, right? And so the first version for them is predominantly using centralized exchanges um, to, to, you know, uh, generate volume and, and scale. But in an ideal world, if you had sufficiently deep liquidity for decentralized perps, which you will, right, um, in the future, um, then 
you could actually wean yourself off centralized exchanges completely and use a decentralized solution. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of synergies between Synthetix and Infinex and Athena in the sense that if Infinex is able to scale up to the same depth and open interest as, let's say, Bybit or Binance, right, um, on BTC and ETH perps, um, then you actually could come in, you know, maybe you'd have to use, if you were going to try and do it with Bitcoin, maybe it's wrapped Bitcoin or something like that, or um, TBTC or, you know, some other Bitcoin derivative. Um, but on an ETH basis, you just bring ETH, drop it in, done, right? And that uses a decentralized execution engine in Synthetix. It would use a decentralized front end in Infinex. And then Athena would be able to connect those two and trade, you know, dynamically. And again, wean itself off this reliance on centralized exchanges because that's what the fault is, right? Um, but yeah, Athena, Athena Super Live, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting to me. Um, and, you know, obviously another thing that I think is going to scale up a lot uh through next year um and you know it, it, the interest rate at the moment is like 19.8 um so it's getting scarily close to the the old magic 20 percent um let's hope that it stays under under 20 percent. honestly i've seen that... it at 30 and 25 percent recently too it's it's nutty yeah. yeah so you know um if that if that genuinely can scale and we can wean athena all by providing deep liquidity on a decentralized exchange, it has the potential to be a, a very powerful decentralized uh, stable point. Um, so yeah, super bullish on on that project. Kane, that, that's one really good example then, I guess, of how Infinex will be working alongside Synthetix. Uh, anything else though to share in terms of like the, the, the roadmap or maybe the vision for why you started Infinex, like how this works in conjunction with everything that's been built through uh, Synthetix. Yeah, I, again, you know, I woke up from a coma um, six months ago, um, you know, took some time off uh, in, in the bear market. And I was like, holy shit, this stuff works. Like what the Synthetix contributors have built now is the thing that we've been promising. You know, I remember a conversation, I think, I, I'm pretty sure it was with someone from Standard Crypto in like 2019. And I was like, we're going to actually nail uh, decentralized perps in like the next three months. Like it's coming. Um, so, you know, it just shows how how ridiculously uh, optimistic I am. But like we got there, right? Like uh, Synthetix was able to deliver this thing. And I was like, okay, wow, this is as good, if not better in some ways, right? Obviously it's better in one critical way, which is that, you know, SBF can't steal your money in Synthetix, right? Like it's actually a decentralized uh, non-custodial system, um, you know, but it's also better in a number of other ways, right? Like it, you know, the funding rates, the way they're calculated, um, it's continuous versus this like discrete interval based system. Like there's some really cool things that I think will, um, as people, as traders get used to them, uh, be very beneficial. Um, and so I was like, this is, it's ready. What are we, what's missing? Why is the world not, you know, uh, kind of driving itself straight into to DeFi and, and trading here. Why are we still seeing 50 plus billion in notional trading volume on centralized exchanges and, you know, a billion on DEXs? And the answer was just UX. That's it. Like in my mind, like it's all there. It's just a UX challenge. People want to be onboarded in a web two way. They want to be onboarded using, you know, emails, passwords. They want to have MFA. They want to have the ability to recover accounts. Um, and so, my idea for starting Infinex was like just YOLO custody it because we have Quenta and Polynomial and other decentralized solutions that are non-custodial. So you just make a custodial version where the assets are custodied, but the execution engine is non-custodial, i.e. synthetics, right? Um, and then as we started building, we were like, oh, actually, all the text there, we don't even need it to be custodial. It could be non-custodial, the entire stack, which was kind of crazy, right? Like there's stuff that people have built, which I genuinely don't know what they were thinking. I started building it like there is no use case for this stuff like you know it was very much like bull market like crazy over investment sort of things but like out of out of that chaos has emerged a bunch of different infrastructure projects that are like critical to something like infinex and i think we're going to see way more infinexes over the next like six to 12 months as people figure this out that you actually can do all of this stuff and make onboarding and, and the ux really simple and seamless I wonder if Coinbase will sort of follow some of the steps you're taking there. I I, I hope not. 
I certainly hope not. Yeah, uh, just to echo that. Yeah, I mean, I think that like the tech has made a, a huge amount of progress. Um, and I mean, not just synthetics, but like um, Oracle networks, bridges, L2s, all of this, like over the last couple of years. Um, and that enables, like as the infrastructure layer, that enables things like low fees, uh, reliable order settlement, just, um, you know, sort of latency, things like that um, are improving that enables the send user experience. But I think the really powerful thing about D5 for the end users is that it enables there uh, to be competition for the front ends. Whereas in, tra in traditional finance, you know, you can't just like, you know, just start spinning up. A, I mean, it's getting a little better in some ways. There, there are different like platforms and APIs you can integrate with. But generally speaking, it's, it's not um, free and open competition to just whoever can create the best user experience um, will track the most users. And um, just seeing a variety of front ends for synthetics for me is really exciting because I think it ends up like that. That's really how DeFi beats TradFi. It's that everyone's just working harder because they want to win. So guys, just like on that note, like does this current vision of what you're bringing to base with Andromeda, like in, I guess, both your opinions, is that, are we, are we there? Are we matching kind of the centralized exchange product now currently, or are we still not quite there yet in, in your guys' opinions? No. What, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I, you know, I'm not a super active trader. I think it depends how you're measuring, like if you're, um, and what your concerns are. So like a uh, variety of assets or maximum open interest, um, centralized exchanges in early 2024, um, are going to, are going to win if you're measuring that way. Um, but in terms of end user experience, just clicking around again, not, not as like a pro trader here. Um, the, the front ends, the, the DeFi front ends I'm using now, like definitely feels better than like TradFi brokerage accounts to me. So, um, yeah, I think there, it sort of, it depends on how, it depends on how you're measuring, but like, I think it's a lot closer than people realize. It, it has completely replaced all front ends for me. I, you know, I think years ago I, I, I was like preaching, I'm using all this DeFi, I'm only using DeFi. But there were moments where, you know, I had to cave to using something like, let's say, Bybit. Yeah, there, there, there just wasn't, uh, there weren't all of the same supported assets. Uh, you know, it became ridiculous trading on Ethereum mainnet. But now that, that has totally changed. In, in fact, the, the, the amount of choices, obviously, that we have, um, Quenta, Polynomial being two that are, you know, powered by uh, synthetics. I'd say the one thing for me that like brings it to parity is the ability or like the speed to add new assets, which I, I want to give credit to the fact that I have been very surprised how quickly certain new assets have been added for synthetics traders. Uh, but yeah, I'd love for it to be that much faster. You know, I, I recognize it, it layers on more risk. You know, I'm, I'm kind of just flippantly saying, let's add bonk, you know. Which, by the way, Bonk is now available now, right? On um, on synthetics, yeah. So, but uh, Kane, well, anything else you'd add to that? So, I think there's there's a couple of things. You know, we've we've obviously with Infinex dug pretty deep into this, right, to see what traders uh, feel like is missing, or what are they, you know, what's actually critical, what's real. One of the funniest things is like asking traders, you know, what's the most important thing, and they're like fees, and we're like, what's your fee rate, and then they don't. Or they like say the wrong fees or something like that, right? And it's like, okay, that's interesting, right? Like psychologically, it feels like fees are the most important thing. But if you don't know what your fee rate is on Binance or Bybit or something like that, right? You think you're paying like 10 bips and it's actually two, um, then, you know, maybe that's actually the case. Um, so there's been some interesting things that have come out of those like user, uh, user interviews and stuff. I think there are some like functional things which are still missing in synthetics, which are close, right? Um, so cross-margining of positions, having like a very powerful cross-margining engine, which was supposed to be in Andromeda originally. Um, but in order to get Andromeda out, um, there was a decision made to, to de-scope some of that stuff, but it's it's coming soon. I think that that is going to be really, really powerful. Um, the ability to cross-margin positions using mm -hmm. weird assets is something that I think FTX did a very good job of, right? And was one of the ways that FTX was able to get everyone to put all their assets on FTX. Because it was like, well, if I can use all of my assets at any time to margin these different positions, have these cross margin things, like, why would I have my assets sitting on Binance when, you know, I go to clear button and I don't have enough leverage because I didn't have my Pepe in, you know, 
FTX, it was sitting on Binance or something like that, right? And so that's something that DeFi is just much better at. Like building like margin systems and decentralized lending and, you know, that's just going to be better than any monolithic Web2 stack where it's just some guy's database. You know, you have to trust the logic of it. You can't actually inspect it. Um, you know, it turns out that it's just like random number generator that says like your loan today is $50 or whatever, right? You know, like the interest rates, like nonsense. There's all of these issues with having opaque systems, right? Um, and, you know, we've seen them firsthand. They're not theoretical issues, right? We've seen almost like one of the nice things about FTX is like they kind of speed ran every single theoretical issue you could have with an opaque system and made it a practical issue that happened in real life, right? Um, and And that's like... This, I mean, you know, we couldn't pay SBF enough money to do that, right? Um, for us, it's a it's an incredible advertisement. But you need to have the stuff that people want. Like, if you have weird order types that don't match what they're used to, then it doesn't work, right? And so there's things that are missing still, like like actual protocol level limit orders. In my mind, is something that I think is missing. Um, and until we have that, I think it's going to be hard to bring across like some of the larger market makers and and you know more normie traders um we've got stuff that is similar like triggered orders but like we need to have the full feature parity set of features that you have on a centralized exchange in order to really get everyone across um all of the other benefits are cool but if you're not at feature parity really then then it's not there and so i think cross margin is a huge one a limit order is another one and these things are like very doable and and probably going to come even you know in, in first quarter next year um so you know, once once we get to that point, I think we're we're more than there, um, and then we can really start to use the power of DeFi to do some super cool stuff that you just can't do on a centralized exchange, right? Like a centralized exchange can integrate Athena, and uh, as can um, you know, as can Infinex, um, but a centralized exchange is going to have a harder time integrating something like Frantech, right, or something like weird inscription systems that we've seen popping up lately like that those really interesting things i think are going to be hard. and then in terms of listings which i think is still the binance playbook the reason why binance won in 2017 was just listing that was it speed of listing which seems like such an obvious easy thing right like how hard could it be but sometimes it is hard right if you're if the listing is some new network and it's not just in the rc20 then there's a lift there, right? Like there's an engineering lift. And I think that that's uh, something that Binance just smashed, right? And it's why they won that that cycle, the 2017, 2018 cycle. Um, we have made our lives much harder than they should have been um, from, you know, Noah's mentioned oracles, right? How much oracles have improved. Um, I think we're going to be able to speed our listing process down to like 24 hours in some cases. There, there are still some issues where we need liquidity. We need to ensure that there are, is perps liquidity for people to be able to hedge. Um, but we also have part of Andromeda is this new liquidity layer, which allows for us to actually have uh, the counterparty risk for some of these things taken on, not by like the stakers of USDC, but by specific pools that are absorbing the counterparty risk of, uh, let's say, a bomb, right? Now, why would someone want to do that? Like that, what, like, why would someone be willing to be the counterparty to that? There's a very obvious reason. They're a large spot holder. That's actually where ultimately all of the derivatives, the liquidity comes from spot, right? Um, you need someone who's holding spot who wants to hedge that position or wants to, you know, lever up that position or whatever, for whatever reason, right? Whatever trade they're putting on, they need to be able to have that. And so the ability for someone who's got a large bulk spot position to short that position in a liquidity pool on V3, which then is the uh, sort of lender of last resort or, or you know, uh, counterparty of last resort, can allow us to potentially launch market instantly, as long as the liquidity is there. People know that that's the place where you can actually, because that's what, so someone who's holding a bunch of bulk, right, on day zero, whoever that is, the bulk treasury or you know, some insider or whatever who wants to hedge that position out. If they know this is the place you can go and they can just go and hedge that position out, that's amazing. Great. Like, don't go to Uniswap and, and dump spot. Like, go and, and hedge there. Guys, this is probably a good place for us to wrap up. So I want to remind our listeners that they should first learn about synthetics by going to synthetics.io. 
Uh, they can follow uh, Kane on Synthetics at K A Y N N E. Uh, you can follow Noah. Noah, can you uh, shout out your Twitter handle for us? Oh, yeah. It's just uh, my first and last name, Noah Litvin. It, uh, yeah, on Twitter. Awesome. And you can find all of that in the show notes. And then, of course, synthetics underscore IO. Guys, thanks so much for taking the time to talk us through all of this. Uh, I'm excited to get to try this uh, once the front ends have integrated this. Andromeda, as of this recording, uh, is live, but you want to wait probably for one of the front ends to uh, make that available to you unless you're a, a more technical user. Um, Kane, Noah, anything else you'd like to share before you go? A- any like final bit of alpha or just recommendation for getting involved in synthetics? We have the uh, synthetic selections coming up. Um, it's a, it's a, um, I think about two weeks away. Um, so yeah, uh, jump on and uh, and if you want to participate in governance, we need more people in governance. Could you run for the U.S. president? Because we we have, I think, better candidates right now for for that <laughs> synthetics council no, than we do here as in the U.S. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> not, it wouldn't work. No, no, the no accent can do would it, work. Course, they would vote for you just because yeah. of the accent. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. If you're a talented founder or developer, please consider reaching out to our team at fourthrevolution.capital. And for future episodes of the Edge podcast, please check out our link tree at edge underscore pod.